Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video, I'll be discussing my thoughts on episode one of the anime series, Everything Becomes F, The Perfect Insider. This was a series that really stood out to me when I was looking over the fall PVs of uh, all, you know, new up-and-coming series, because it heavily reminded me in sort of the character design and just the look of it, the aesthetic of it, of uh, Zankyo No Terror, a series that I was left really chomping at the bit to get into and felt was very bold in the course of its, you know, story, the, the story that it told. And um, so I thought going into this, I was really going to be chomping at the bit to want to talk about it after watching this first episode. And um, quite sort of uh, remarkably, I was left with the antithesis of fact. I was left somewhat, you know, struggling with it and mulling over whether I even wanted to talk about it by the end. Not because it was bad, but because I just, I don't know what the hell it's going to amount to. I don't know what it's, you know, all about. And um, there was this really unnerving sense of dread in watching it. This very, you know, <laughs> just, I don't know, a really off-putting sense and vibe that it wasn't vibrant. It wasn't, you know, even if we're watching sort of a uh, slice of life anime, you know, even when it's mundane, even when it's grueling, there's still an aspect of it that, you know, entrances you, that gets you watching it. And this, you know, I kind of had to struggle through it to just piece it together and see what was going on. And a lot of the dialogue, you know, the dialogue is what I think foremost stands out to me in being very sort of existential and philosophical and intriguing, um, mysterious, enigmatic, and all these kinds of things. And at the same time, there's a level of almost pomposity that I feel like is imbued in at least one of the main characters. You know, we're, we're basically dealing with what appear to be two main characters, um, the female character, who we're seeing most, I guess, through the interactions, through the eyes of uh, Nishina Sono, and what I thought was maybe her teacher or tutor, Sekawa, but I guess they're kind of more friends. Um, it, it's not entirely clear, except to say that Sekawa is a very high intellect. He was the student, I think, of uh, Nishina Sono's father or something along those lines. Um, I wasn't entirely clear on it, but um, it just really got under my skin. It just really unnerved me watching this episode for some reason. Um, you know... I could almost equate it to being like the film One Hour Photo, if you've ever seen that. But I feel like that did it in a way that was accessible, that drew you in. Whereas this just kind of, you kind of, at least for me, have to fight to want to stay attuned to the world and to wanting to figure it out and put it together. Um, and it's almost as though it's a challenge in that way. Like maybe uh, that feel was done deliberately to challenge you to break beyond your perceptions and preconceptions, which is something I'm always championing doing and something I aspire to do, in, you know, of my own opinions and, and thoughts and uh, theories and speculations, whether it comes to anime, entertainment, or life in general. And um, so I have to give it high marks for just being a very sort of intellectual piece and having, for lack of a better term, a lot of intriguing aspects as, you know, we're getting to know kind of these two characters, their relationships with each other. She's making coffee. She's like, you know, oh, you must be in a bad mood today. You're drinking soda straight from the can. You didn't make coffee and yada yada. Something is very much on his mind. What is it? We don't know. Um, there's an interruption where, you know, a kid from, I guess, another class or office or whatever, wherever they are, wherever they're located, uh, whose computer is malfunctioning. And I guess the teacher for that class we are later introduced to, Kaneda, uh, is not available. or <laughs> She doesn't want to be bothered. So Saikawa leaves the room to go deal with that. And we find out there might be a virus or something along those lines. And it's just like I'm picking at the threads here, trying to piece together what of all of these revelations amount to anything. What out of all of this stuff has some bearing on the story and the events. And we see that uh, Nishina Sono goes to his computer where on the screen is the name Magata. Um, <laughs> the I guess you could say infamous Dr. Magata as we are introduced to her. And we find out that she supposedly killed her parents. Um, to hear her tell it, she witnessed a doll come to life and do it and then spirit away. I think they said she even went missing for a time. Um, but of course she is seemingly incarcerated at this juncture in what I can only presume to be a sort of criminal asylum. Um, you know, Nishona Sono is only allowed to talk to her through this video capture feed. Um, 
and there's a lot of questioning going back and forth. And it seems like this Magata has familiarity with her to a point, you know, she is asking her name and her age and trying to understand more about her, I guess. And being, you know, you don't have the knowledge at that point that she is said to have killed her parents. This comes very much up in dialogue. Uh, Nishino Sono is asking her about it. And the straw that breaks the camel's back is very much Nishino Sono is asking her what her motive was for killing her parents. Completely ignoring this doll come to life story. And so all of these things, I'm wondering, you know, is this computer virus, is there some bearing on the story that has to do with this hacking, that kind of component uh, and technical nature? Is that going to be part of the story? Is there a supernatural element? Is this woman, Magata, absolutely out of her gourd? Is she completely psychotic? She killed her parents because she was such a high intellectual mind, as we are led to believe. She's like a child prodigy, and she's already asking philosophical questions about life and death and all these things. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, what is going on in, in this series? What, you know, is there going to be a supernatural element, like I say, where either she's psychotic or it's true that a doll came to life? Is there some kind of demonology and monsters and supernatural elements affecting this character probably not and then you know i almost feel like there's nobody to root for i think that's also part of the problem other than nishina sono herself maybe because i thought the relationship between she and sakawa was going to be one of the elements that really draws me in and you know he's kind of very much existential as well and i can almost equate the qualms he speaks about and and what we hear in the narration of the story from this elder doctor man who uh, took, you know, the Magato girl when she was a little girl, took care of her for a little while when the parents were busy or whatever, you know, um, whatever that means. Uh, we hear so much of her questioning what life means, what, what the meaning of life is, what being here is, who am I, you know, what is my purpose in the universe, and all these existential things that can become... A crisis of self for some people can break one's mind if it becomes all-consuming, which may be the case in this series. Um, but I almost equate it with Motoko Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell, where I feel like that curiosity about the soul and the machinery and what makes a human brain and, and you know, uh, the energy that we assume bodies are be filled with that at least, you know, per certain religions and mysticisms mean there's an energy that is what we refer to as a soul and all these things, like I found it much more captivating in that frame of reference because I could root for characters in that series. And I think because Saikawa's, you know, as we get through the course of this episode, he's very much consumed with meeting Magata and he is so drawn to her and so fascinated by her because of that high intellect that he possesses. He too is an award-winning, uh, you know, academic and... It's sort of, you know, he probably feels very lonely in the world. And I think it's a situation where, you know, what he's left with is, I want to escape. And when Nishinosono asks him, what do you want to escape? He's like, this world. And it's like, is he suicidal? Is he curious about the wonder of what is beyond this mortal coil? Um, there isn't a sense of awe and wonder. There isn't a sense of being sort of... Uh, you know, I mean, it's almost introspective. There isn't an expounding nature to it to want to explore and understand and seek the knowledge. It's just sort of like more depressive, I think, is what it's really getting to at the heart of the entire matter. And that really kind of put me off a bit. Um, you see this Nishina Sono character, and she's very much the vibrance of this episode. She's getting all excited about, uh, you know, because another student, the cat who actually had the computer virus problems, is talking about, you know, a trip, taking a trip, uh, doing something like that. And she basically puts to them, you know, let's go to Himaka Island, this place where Magata had uh, conducted experiments or, or where she's housed now, whatever it is, because Nishina Sono, again, adding to that jabbing nature, she's very much jabbing at Saikawa. Hey, I got in to talk to her. I had my, uh, <laughs> you know, my aunt, my father's sister get me in there, insinuate me in there. That's how I had this meeting with her. And aren't you just so jealous, you know, to Saikawa and all this stuff? And he's determined to get in to have a confrontation, have a conversation with Magata. And it's just like, 
by the end, it's just, I felt very unnerved and unsettled, and I just didn't know whether or not it was going to become as captivating as I hope it will. Um, all of that said, my qualms, you know, uh, said and done, I will be definitely checking out the second episode, and I hope that it does give me a, a sense of more than just dread, a sense of more than unnervingness to the story and to these characters and to this environment and this, you know, I, I'm finding enrapturing the level of intellect going into the dialogue and going into that philosophical dilemma. But at the same time, it's just there's such that unnerving edge to it. I feel like I'm not drawn to this world. I feel like I'm not drawn to the experience. And I don't know whether that says something about me psychologically being more optimistic rather than pessimistic. And still yet being a pragmatist, um, you know, for the most part. It's just very intriguing how this episode left me, very unexpectedly how it left me. Because I figured I'd be very much excited. I feel I felt like I'd be bouncing off the walls, the same rubber walls Magata may arguably be encased in, because of her potential for madness. Um, but it could be that she's, you know, a sociopath. It could be that she's just on a different emotional, mental plane. And I don't know how much of that, if any of it, is going to be an exploration in this story. I don't know what elements of this episode, other than kind of sort of getting to know the depressive Saikawa, the very uh, boisterous Nishonosono, the uh, sort of plain stated Kunida, and uh, you also have this character, Gido, I think her name is, um, who, who Saikawa seems consumed enough with Nishinosono to be talking about her behind her back. Is he perchance looking at her through the Petri dish like uh, a guinea pig to experiment on? Is there some kind of connection between he and Magata along those lines? That could be an interesting aspect, quite frankly, which only just occurred to me as I'm recording now. And um, so, yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below. What's your take on the first episode of Everything Becomes F? The Perfect Insider is whether uh, you were just chomping at the bit and you, you know, successfully were left feeling that way by the end. If, like me, you aren't sure, you're not sure-footed enough to know whether or not you're going to get into it. Um, and I guess, you know, time will tell for me personally. But uh, yeah, I love having the conversation with you guys. Even if we agree to disagree, I still love going back and forth and exploring how we are meant to feel and uh, be entertained by series such as this. So otherwise, it'll be pretty much it for me on this. Hope this video finds you well. And I'll catch you all later. Peace.